Coming up, the nation's top doctor issues a new warning this week about loneliness. And my question is, what causes loneliness? The U.S. Surgeon General will be here to answer that question and more. Then, crowning of the king. What do you think of the king? I think he's good. The coronation of King Charles is here, and our pair of Kids Edition correspondents are on the ground in London covering the story for us and have everything you need to know. Here at Westminster Abbey, coronations have been held since 1066. Also, new arrival. The birth of this rare antelope in Oregon has zoo officials going wild. They don't follow the rules when it comes to what you would expect from a little antelope. We'll tell you why and explain exactly what a Badabak is. Plus, the conservation kid. He's 13 and on a mission to clean up America's waterways. We ended up founding the cleanup kids to spread the word to kids all around the world that they can make a difference no matter how old or how young you are. His remarkable story just ahead. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt. Great to be with you guys. I'm out here on the West Coast coming to you from Universal Studios Hollywood this week, which is part of our parent company, NBC Universal. I'm at Illumination's Despicable Me Minion Mayhem. That's a mouthful, and it's pretty cool. We have a super lineup ahead, including our pop quiz. This week, we're tackling the U.S. presidents. And a little bit later on, we'll introduce you to these students who just built the very first American moon rover. We can't wait to tell you all about it. It just really goes to show that there's no limits to what you can do. And uh, life is really unexpected. So just keep your eyes open for the opportunities. But first, we want to begin with one of the stories we're covering this week, and that's our mental health. The U.S. Surgeon General has a new warning out about an epidemic of loneliness. Dr. Vivek Murthy admits he also suffered from loneliness and says there are some things kids and grown-ups can do to not feel alone. We get more now from our friend Stephanie Gosk. And kids, you may want to grab a parent or grown-up to watch along with you in case you have any questions. No matter how young or old you are, there's a good chance you have felt lonely at some point. Loneliness is a feeling, and it's a feeling that the connections we need in our life are greater than the connections we actually have. And in that gap, we experience loneliness. Because it's a feeling, you can be surrounded by lots of people and feel lonely. Uh, if you don't necessarily feel like they're people, you can be yourself around. We sat down with Dr. Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General. His job as the nation's doctor is to keep the country informed about the latest health and safety information. And his latest report is all about loneliness. Did you know half of U.S. adults experience measurable loneliness? And that number is even greater among young adults. That's why it's important for kids and grown-ups to keep an eye on how they're feeling and to communicate those feelings to someone they trust. Loneliness is a feeling just like hunger or thirst. It's a natural signal that our body sends us when we are lacking something we need for survival. And our goal is to be able to help people understand that so they can respond in those moments in ways that are healthy. When it comes to the root of loneliness, one of our Nightly News Kids Edition viewers had a question for Dr. Murthy. Hi, my name is Eileen. I'm from Queens, New York. And my question is, what causes loneliness? Eileen, that's a great question. What causes loneliness? Well, it turns out that we feel lonely when we don't have people in our life that we can be ourselves with, people who we know care about us and, and support us. And a lot of people feel that way. And if you do, it doesn't mean you did something wrong. It doesn't mean uh, that it's your fault. Uh, it just means that we have to, to focus on building uh, stronger friendships and that it's okay to reach out for help as well. Uh, it's never wrong to talk to your mom or your dad and tell them that you're feeling lonely. It's something all of us go through at some point. The good news is there are plenty of things you can do to feel more connected. You might consider joining a volunteer group or after school program to make new friends with your parents' permission, of course. And it's also a good idea to be mindful of how you're using technology. In-person matters. Connecting online has its place, has its value, but it's not a substitute for in-person connection. We really do need both. One more piece of advice from Dr. Murthy. Keep an eye on your friends and classmates and check in with them about how they're feeling. Well, if you have a friend who's struggling with loneliness, it's important just to check on them and let them know that you are there for them. Even if they don't say a whole lot in response, 
Uh, it means a lot for people to know someone cares about them. And all of us have the power to heal, to be a part of the solution when it comes to loneliness. All right, Stephanie, thanks so much. Important information there. Okay, time now for our pop quiz. President Joe Biden just recently announced he's running for re-election. And it got us thinking, President Biden is the nation's 46th president, but there have only been 45 presidents. So the question is, which president is counted twice? Is it A, Andrew Jackson, B, Grover Cleveland, or C, Barack Obama? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, time's up. The answer is B, Grover Cleveland. President Cleveland is counted twice as our 22nd and 24th president because he was elected for two non-consecutive terms. Cleveland was elected president in 1884, lost his re-election campaign in 1888, and then won the presidency for a second time in 1892. That's a great piece of trivia. All right, let's head overseas now where history is in the making. The coronation of King Charles. Following the death of his mom, Queen Elizabeth, Charles became king last fall. And now he will officially be crowned King of England. Our twin kids edition correspondents are on the ground in London with what this all means. History, crown and all. It's the big moment in British history. The coronation of King Charles III at Westminster Abbey. A coronation is when the king is crowned in an ancient ceremony. At his side, his wife, Queen Camilla. Here at Westminster Abbey, coronations have been held since 1066. William the Conqueror was crowned here more than 950 years ago. Queen Elizabeth was just 26 years old when she had her coronation at this abbey. And her son, Prince Charles, just four years old, watched from the balcony. The Queen's coronation was the first to be televised. There were no colour TVs back then. It was all in black and white. Millions around the world watched. King Charles is following coronation traditions. He is seated in the same coronation chair. It isn't a fancy throne, but a plain wooden chair used for 700 years. It can't be comfortable, but it's steeped in history. And the King is using the same crowns as his mother, Queen Elizabeth. Not just one, but two, covered in jewels. They've been worn by kings and queens throughout history. What will King Charles travel in? A horse-drawn carriage, like every king and queen for hundreds of years. It was built in 1762, and it is beautiful, but maybe not so comfortable. And taking part in the ceremony, as one of the pages of honour, Prince George, grandson of King Charles, after his father, Prince William, he will one day be king too. We decided to ask some kids what they think of the royals. Uh, I like them because they work hard to make our country safe, you know. What do you think of the king? I think he's good. This is a day when crowds line the streets to celebrate the crowning of their new king. The parade, or procession, as it is called here, is a part of British history. It is a moment of being British together. That's it from Royal London. I'm Ilya. I'm Ariana. Long, Long live the king. Back, Back to you in the studio, Lester. Girls, three cheers to you. That was terrific. This is the best I can do with my royal wave, but it comes from the heart. All right, back at home, the recent birth of a rare antelope has one zoo really excited, and it's good news for this species. Our friend Ann Thompson explains. A rare birth met with celebration last month at the Oregon Zoo. The birth of a baby Bontobock. The little boy was born on April Fool's Day and just took his first steps out of the private enclosure. So what exactly is a Bontobock? Bontobock are a medium-sized antelope. So as an adult, this little guy will weigh about 170 pounds. They don't follow the rules when it comes to what you would expect from a little antelope. While many antelope run fast and jump really high, the Bontobock does not. In fact, this creature doesn't jump at all, preferring to stay low to the ground and move slowly. These guys don't jump. 
they'll hop a little bit, but they don't jump. Bontabok are also really picky eaters. They won't eat from bushes or tree branches, only munching on different types of grass. And that leads to another unusual thing about the Bontabok. We do not see them drink water. Never see them drinking. They get all the moisture they need out of that grass that they're eating. Because of their picky diets and calm personalities, the Bontabok are an extremely vulnerable species in the wild. These guys are found only in a very small section of South Africa. And actually a couple hundred years ago, they realized that they had been hunted almost to extinction. There were only 17 of them left. The Bontabok would have gone extinct without the courageous work of a group of farmers in South Africa who rounded up the remaining 17 animals and built them a fenced area to keep them safe. And because the Bontabok don't jump, they stayed inside the enclosures, protected from hunters and predators. Thanks to the conservation efforts of those farmers, the Bontabok National Park was built in 1931 as a dedicated space for this species. Today, programs like the Association of Zoos and Aquariums continue to support this vulnerable species, and there are now estimated to be close to 3,000 Bontabok around the world. To go from 17 animals to two or 3,000 that are strong and thriving and genetically in great shape, it's, it's really a testament to what people can do to help animals when they put their mind to it. And with the Oregon Zoo's new baby boy, the future of the Bontabok is looking brighter every day. All right, Ann, thanks so much. I learned a few things myself. All right, let's turn now to our Inspiring Kids series. Earth Day, you'll recall, was last month, but taking care of our planet is something kids and grown-ups can do year-round. And there's one Tennessee teenager who is helping to clean up the rivers and other waterways around the country. Our friend Kristen Dahlgren has the story. Cash's journey of taking care of the planet all began with a discarded plastic straw. When I was seven years old, me and my family went on a beach vacation and I found a plastic straw. I made the connection that that straw might harm the animals that I loved. And I've loved animals ever since I can remember anything. Cash discovered his home state of Tennessee had a big pollution problem. I ended up finding out that 80% of all ocean trash actually comes from rivers, and the Tennessee River in particular is the most polluted with microplastics than any other river tested in the entire world. So Cash decided to take action to help clean up polluted rivers and oceans. Last year, he and a team of volunteers picked up over 1 million pounds of trash as part of his group called Clean Up Kids, which he formed with his friend Ella. We ended up founding the Clean Up Kids to spread the word to kids all around the world that they can make a difference no matter how old or, or how young you are, that you can make a difference. So we are here on the Tennessee River, and just a quick reminder, always leave places better than you found it. The 13-year-old has also taken to social media to educate kids and grown-ups about pollution around the world and inspire them to make a difference. A couple days ago, I was cleaning up trash just me. And let me show you what you can do when it's more than one person. And Cash's most recent cleanup project involves something that you might not think about, fishing line. He's installing recycling bins near rivers and lakes in Tennessee. These monofilament recycling bins are made for fishing line because here in Tennessee, we have a bunch of fishing tournaments and all these fishing tournaments bring in a lot of waste. And we've estimated that we've collected over 4,000 miles of fishing line. Keeping that fishing line out of waterways protects sea creatures like turtles, seabirds, and seals who are at risk of getting tangled up and hurt. It's a love for those creatures that motivates Cash to continue his work as the conservation kid. And he hopes kids and grown-ups alike can follow his lead. Doesn't matter how old or how young you are, you can make a difference. Kids may be a small part of the population, but we are 100% of the future. All right, Kristen, thanks so much. Finally, we have a really cool story about a group of students who are making history. They are set to land the first robotic American rover on the moon. We get details now from our friend Callie Lichter. We have a liftoff. That's one small step for man. 
Nearly five decades after NASA put a man on the moon, the first American moon rover is set to make that same journey. But this rover isn't made by the space agency. It's made by students at Carnegie Mellon University. And it's mostly students working on this project. A great deal of them are undergraduates like myself. The student's mission is also a first, to show others that rovers like IRIS, small and cost-effective, can compete on the moon. On its 50-hour mission, they'll see how the rover drives while it performs a series of geological tests. And did you know, the rovers help scientists better understand places like the moon. Unlike the Apollo missions, students will control IRIS from their command center on Earth. It has four wheels, cameras, radios, batteries, electronics, and things to regulate the temperature so that the electronics can stay at the right temperature to keep working. Professor Red Whitaker is one of the only faculty members working on this project. He made his first backyard rocket at nine years old. Red said Iris is different than other rovers on the moon. There has never been anything close to something this small, this low a weight. Iris will be the smallest moon rover ever. This Chinese-made rover, the only active one on the moon right now, is roughly five feet tall and weighs about 300 pounds. Iris is the size of a shoebox and weighs just under four and a half pounds. For mission control lead Nikolai Stefanov, Iris's small design helps inspire other young people to go for the stars. We like the idea that we're trying to open up space to everybody because quite frankly, we do need everybody to get to space. Like systems management lead Divya Rao. One of my uh, childhood dreams, in fact, was um, to be an astronaut. And while I'm not actually going to the moon right now, um, I think, you know, being able to send my name to the moon and put something on there is close enough. Rao's third grade teacher sparked her interest in space, which has encouraged her journey to the moon. So what advice would you give to kids who want to reach for the moon themselves? It just really goes to show that there's no limits to what you can do and uh, life is really unexpected. So just keep your eyes open for the opportunities. Iris will be launching into space later this summer, but the team will keep on working because, as they say, there's never a second chance to be first. When you choose something like this for your life very openly and then give it everything, no matter how it turns out, you can't lose. And no matter what happens up on the moon, with Iris's launch, it completes its true mission, showing the final frontiers for all, no matter how small. Callie, thanks so much for bringing us that terrific story. Amazing. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, and remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long from Universal Studios Hollywood. I'll see you next time.